integration for your database migrations by Joshua Hesketh. Uh, Joshua is a software developer for Rackspace Australia working on upstream OpenStack. He works from his home in Hobart, Tasmania. Josh is currently president of Linux Australia, previously the co-chair for PyCon Australia and a key organizer for linux.conf.au. Josh is an active contributor to the Open Structure Infra and Nova projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Joshua Hesketh. How's that? Oh, hello. <laughs> Sorry, probably should have tried that. But uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so there's not really any point to this slide because you just heard that. But we're here to talk about uh, database, well, testing for your database migrations. Uh, so hopefully the takeaway from this talk will be how you can test your uh, schema changes and your database migrations to make sure that they will work in real scenarios rather than just in your test, uh, or rather than just in your development environment. Um, so to make sure we're on the same page, we just need to go over some really quick terminology. Uh, a schema version is a, a number that we give to the database in a particular state. So at version 200, there might be 10 tables, but then at version 201, there's an 11th table, so you've added a table. Or you might have added a column, uh, changed the column type, and things like that. So that's uh, typically, you give them a number so that when you have multiple developers working on things, you can make sure that you're um, coherent in talking about what the schema looks like. And a migration is the process of moving between these two versions. So the mig migration is the actual code that will create the table or will insert the column or, or whatever operation it is that you wish to perform. Uh, a data set for the purposes of this talk is a copy of real production data. So um, rather than calling it a database because we have multiple database engines, which is Postgres or MySQL or Pocona, that's, that's a database engine. A data set for the purpose of this talk is a snapshot that we've taken of data that we wish to test against. So usually this is production data because that will give us the best results. If it doesn't work on your production data, well, you have a problem. Um, SQL Alchemy is the ORM uh, library that Nova uses. Uh, it's not particularly important to this talk, but it does, it is the component that crafts the actual SQL to be executed. Uh, and we'll cover the other ones um, in due course anyway. Uh, so to help you visualize it, I like seeing code. Uh, maybe it's just me. But this is uh, an actual migration from the Nova project. And, and just in case you're unfamiliar with Nova, that is the compute part of OpenStack. Nova is the one that handles it. When you ask OpenStack, can you boot me an instance? Nova is the one that goes off and finds space on the hypervisor and schedules it in and boots it for you. So Nova was storing uh, the server names in an instances table. This was moved out into a metadata um, type table, so the column was no longer needed in the instances table. And migration 138 removes that. So you can see that it has the server name dot drop, and that's, that's just SQL Alchemy's formatting. Whatever database engine or even just pure SQL that you're using, you can express that in. So we define an upgrade and a downgrade. So when somebody wishes to enter into version 138 of the schema, the upgrade will be ran, the column will be dropped, um, and vice versa if they want to roll back because an upgrade was unsuccessful or for some other reason, there's a downgrade method as well. You will note, however, the downgrade here is lossy. You're not going to actually get your data back. But we'll touch lightly on the usefulness of downgrades, but um, I think that's a bit of a tangent anyway. It, it is also actively debated to whether or not we should bother with downgrades um, in OpenStack, but for the moment, we actually think they are useful. Um, and continuous integration, you're probably, most of you are familiar with it, but in OpenStack land, uh, and what we're talking about is actually testing before the patches um, emerged. So you propose a patch, uh, the bots run away and they test your code and they report back a result. So you actually know if it's going to work or not before you merge the code. Um, so what are we trying to do here, and, and what is our motivation behind this? You may have already heard that OpenStack does all this impressive testing on giant scales, in which it does. However, it also even exercises the migrations. For example, uh, in its functional testing, it will insert five rows into the instances table, in the example given, uh, 
uh, it will run the migration 138 and then it will check if the column server name no longer exists. Okay, that's success. And that worked fine on five rows in this functional test. But in a real public cloud or in a large project, you might have 500,000 rows or a few million. And how does it perform? Uh, database migrations often have to be done during maintenance windows. So this actually means downtime for public APIs or public clouds or, or whatever you're working with. And that's very costly when you have to adhere to SLAs. So the purposes of what we, we're trying to test here, or one of the things that's important to us here is the timing of um, migrations because it causes a lot of pain for operators. But there's also a scheme of drift. Granted, the unit test inserted five rows and made sure that the operation applied to it okay. But the five rows were inserted with data that it expected it to be. But the cloud maybe, or the software may be used in a form that you don't expect it to be in, where data was inserted into a column that isn't formatted quite the same. Um, maybe you have a migration where you've gone, well, actually, server names are never longer than 30 characters. Let's just bring this varchar down to be smaller. But in reality, you have real production uh, databases with very long names. So you have to um, take into account schema drift. We also found in doing this a whole heap of broken uh, downgrades, which um, actually serves to the point that people don't use them because they didn't work. Uh, so we discovered that, but it just shows better testing gets to catch these things. Um, they were tested in the unit tests where, you know, again, those five rows were inserted. Uh, the upgrade was applied, the downgrade was applied, and the data was checked. But what wasn't happening is um, when you have all this schema drift and actual real data, it doesn't always work. Um, so what are our goals? They are to catch those slow migrations. They're to catch the migrations that don't work against real data sets, so mostly due to schema drift, but there are sometimes other odd reasons. Um, and to test new migrations, but also existing migrations. For example, if a patch is proposed that modifies the core component of your project, it may actually affect the performance of a migration that you've already accepted. So migration 138, you, you've looked at the results from the testing infrastructure and said, you know what, this migration looks good to me. It's a very fast process to drop a column. We'll merge it in. But then later on, someone changes how SQL Alchemy drops columns, and now for every row, it, it clears it out first. It's a bit of a, a silly example, but it's just to, to say that modifications to the core also need to be tested. We can't just test new migrations. We have to test every code change going into the project. Um, and we need to catch these problems early because if a migration is merged in, uh, at least in our case, the software is often deployed in continuous deployment, which means that operators have already applied the migration. And if you were to modify the migration after someone has already ran it, you'll end up with two different users with two different uh, schemas that your code now needs to support, which is clearly not viable because uh, you can end up in very um, messed up different states. Um, so it all really comes down to easing the pain to operators. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so this is the command that Nova um, comes with to upgrade your database. It's just Nova Manage DB Sync, and it will go up to the latest version uh, schema file it has. Um, it, they're just Python files in a directory with upgrade and downgrade methods. It will go to the latest one it can find. You can also just specify the version number, as you can see grayed out there, if you want to go to a specific version or if you want to go back a version. So how do we actually test that this operation that uh, operators have to do or users have to do, how do we test that it's actually acceptable? Um, so clearly we care about the timing. So did this perform within the acceptable time range or is it outside of that? But we can also get some other statistics from you know, DB, which is one of the MySQL um, database drivers, um, such as how many rows were read or changed or updated and so on and so forth. So we can decide whether or not that is acceptable. Um, so how do we implement it? This is a very crude example of how OpenStack infrastructure does its testing. Um, basically, a human proposes a patch into Girit. Girit is a code review system. Uh, it has an event stream, that software called Zool, which is another Python project, open source, uh, watches, it notices when an event is created, such as uh, an event might be a patch was uploaded, and it knows what actions to take when events happen. So 
okay, a new patch is uploaded, I need to run um, the PEP8 jobs, the unit test jobs, the tarball jobs, all these other kinds of jobs, um, of which there are 3,500 um, in OpenStack, but that's a different story. Jenkins then says, I know how to run the PEP8 job or the unit test job or, or whichever it is. So Zool will hand Jenkins the work, Jenkins will do the work and return the results. So that's very crudely how it works. What we are doing uh, kind of sits in parallel. Now the reason that it sits parallel and not with the rest of the infrastructure is that we can't give the OpenStack infrastructure project um, copies of our production databases. We want to make sure our production databases are actually tested and that any uh, new code that is proposed into OpenStack will work when we go to deploy it. It's very important to us. But we also just can't give away our public, uh, sorry, our private databases to the, um, the public infrastructure. So we run it in parallel, um, where we have our own Zool, which subscribes to the same event stream. Uh, we then have workers called Turbo Hipster that uh, watch Zool, uh, will say, say to Zool, I know how to run the database migration um, test. So Zool will hand the work off to Turbo Hipster, which will run the test in a plugin. It will upload some results to a log storage, um, or upload the logs to the log storage, and return the results back to Garrett. So in the code review system, you will see a vote from, uh, from Jenkins, which is the OpenStax CI, which is all the typical PEP tests and unit tests and so on. But you also see a comment against your patch from Turbo Hipster, which is testing your database migrations. So if you're doing this yourself in your own company and uh, you weren't uh, doing any kind of public code review, you could do all this in one system. But uh, for our, our needs, we have to do this in two systems. And just to give you a really uh, quick idea of the scale, in one OpenStack release, there was uh, 260 individual contributions uh, doing run roughly 100 patches per day. Uh, we have 20 Turbo Hipster nodes or worker nodes, uh, which would do about 800 jobs per day because there's eight data sets that need to be tested for each um, patch. Uh, and over six months, it was around 1.5 gig. So when we can sustain that workload across 20 nodes, frankly, you could probably do it across five nodes if you don't really care about how quickly you're returning results back to the users against their patch. Um, so what is Turbo Hipster? Turbo Hipster means it's testing ironically. Read into the name what you will, or who about it you will. Um, so Turbo Hipster is a task runner or a test runner. Uh, it, it takes a bunch of plugins that do different things. It registers with Zool, and the plugins will say, hey, I know how to do database migrations. But it could also actually say, hey, I know how to do the PEP8 jobs. But we let um, Jenkins handle those. Uh, it runs the jobs, stores the logs, returns the results. Um, it, uh, Turbo Hips actually only talks to Zool, despite what the diagrams showed, because uh, Zool will collate all the results and send one comment back into Garrett. So Garrett is, uh, Zool is what talks to Garrett, basically. Um, so how do you configure Turbo Hipster? It looks a little bit like this. Um, you just, it, need, it wants to know where Garrett is and where to get the patches from. It wants to know where the Git origin is so that it can get stable and master branches and, and so on. And it wants to know the Gearman host, and which is simply the protocol that is used to talk between Zool and the workers. Um, it wants to know where to put some logs and some uh, working directories and things. It wants to know how to publish the um, uh, logs, which we use Swift, which is an object storage. Uh, and it wants to, uh, so it also allows you to configure, uh, extend the configuration in a conf.d directory. Uh, in there is where we actually store our plugin information. Um, where the, it, it allows us to load a plugin and register to Zool a function. So in the first example, it's actually saying that um, Turbo Hipster will tell Zool, I know how to do the real DB upgrade Nova MySQL DevStack 13.10.07 job, which is to say, um, I know how to do the real DB testing for the Nova project against the MySQL database engine using the data set that I have named DevStack 13.10.07, which is simply the date that I exported some test data. Um, and you'll note that the second one is very similar, except that it's going to run against Pocona rather than MySQL. Um, so yeah, you'll notice that there's also a data set directory 
So that's basically where we actually store the data that we want to test against. And in there, there is another config that explains a, a little bit of um, metrics about this. And we'll, we'll look at this in a bit more detail, but the important part for now is simply this is what defines where to get your SQL from. So it's just a big dump of SQL that we want to test against. Um, you, it probably could be um, compressed, but we're not at the moment. <coughs> um, so the RealDB plugin to Turbo Hipster is the actual part that does the database testing migration. So up until this point, we've just been talking rather generically about how we're doing CI. Um, because this part is really a bit of an anticlimax because it's not that complicated. Uh, we check out the code. Um, you know, we grab it from Garrett using this script because Garrett's where it was proposed. And we create a working branch in Git. We bootstrap the new test database. So we use that config.json file to basically load in a big SQL dump. We upgrade to the current state of trunk. Uh, but to do that, we'll step through the releases. So we'll run all the migrate. So a database data set that we're testing against may have been snapshotted in an older release, let's say uh, during Grizzly, and release names are just alphabetical. Um, so we actually want to run all the migrations that are in Havana before we move on to the migrations that are in Icehouse. So this little bit here just um, checks out the, the current stable branch that needs to be tested against, which is Grizzly, and runs DB Sync. And so DB Sync's where the magic kind of happens, um, which is, looks like this. And the important part is we're finally to where we're calling the Nova Manage, the part that we wanted to test. We are doing this in a loop because we want to call it one version number at a time, simply so we can do some um, statistics in between. So we run this and we time it, uh, and then we also dump out, which you can see a couple of lines below, the InnoDB statistics. So for every migration, we're now getting the InnoDB statistics. We upgrade to the um, current state of the patch, which is very similar. It's basically, we just check out the patch and run DB sync again. Then we downgrade to the first migration, the last stable release, which is another DB sync call, and we upgrade again. Or better visualized, something like this. So no matter what version uh, or what database schema version it was added as a snapshot, if that's where you start and it comes down to the bottom, then it will go back up to the last stable release, which is Icehouse currently, uh, and then it will go back down again. The second time back down, it will be with the patch set checked down. So we're actually testing um, that the patch works in both downgrades and upgrade directions. So then, once we've done this, this is just really exercise in database migrations, we need to determine if it passed or failed. So the first metric that we can use for this really is, did the shell script just work or did it exit with an error code? Very easy metric. If it's an error code, it fails. Um, which can be quite quick. Sometimes people just don't have proper Python and it just fails instantly. Um, but otherwise, we get a log that looks roughly like this. So each line uh, is migrating from one, uh, 217 to 218. It's done, 218 to 219, and so on. How do we get the timing? Well, you just take a difference of the timestamps. But in between each of these, we also get those InnoDB statistics, which I referred to. So you can start to pull out things like the deleted rows and the inserted rows. But uh, so this migration, whichever one I just got at random, was really low. It only read five rows. That seems pretty acceptable. I mean, if you have 100,000 users, reading five rows in a migration is nothing. What if you had one user? Is that acceptable? So we actually need, on a per data set level, depending on the size of the data set we're, we're testing, something to tune whether or not it's acceptable. And that's where we come back to this config that I mentioned earlier, is that we can actually specify uh, how many rows read is acceptable for this particular data set. And we specify a default so no database migration may do more than 100,000 reads. But then we also have some exceptions. Sometimes it's just necessary to do more reads. We need this schema change to come in. The performance was acceptable, yet it's doing extra reads. So we add an exception here so that the jobs will pass. Otherwise, it will continue to vote negative on subsequent jobs as well. We do the same things for rows changed. And we do the same things for migration times. So these are just in seconds. So we're basically saying for the data set, whatever this example was, 60 seconds 
is the maximum time any migration should take. Because you also have to keep in mind that um, during an outage, you may run 10 or a few dozen migrations, especially if you're going from one stable release of OpenStack to another. And, and again, this is during a maintenance window, so you want these to be performant. Um, and, the, and these things can be specified in two directions, where a downgrade may take longer for um, some reasons, depending on what the migrations look like, so we can specify them in each direction. So, we now have exercised the migrations, we've looked at the results and we've determined whether or not it's acceptable within the bounds of the particular data set. Um, Zool was then able to take all these results, collate them, and return them back into uh, Garrett. And this is what it looks like when it leaves a comment on Garrett. Uh, so it's simply the job name and a success or failure. You can click on the job name and you get the full logs. Uh, but at this point, it's just um, advisory. Interestingly, the last ones were failing there because in this real data set, the downgrades weren't working until we backported a fix. They are working now. So that's kind of how that all ties together. Um, excuse me. So security it becomes a bit of an issue because we have our um, databases that we want to test against, uh, but we don't want people to have access to the databases. And uh, maybe this is true of all people running some kind of continuous integration is that you're executing arbitrary code from people that you don't necessarily know. Granted, we may have a contributor agreement thing, but we really don't know who these people are and it, whether or not they have a malicious intent. So security is very important to us. Uh, we really, um, I, I should point out, we actually don't, for this reason, test um, Rackspace's public cloud database in the publicly visible term of hipster. We're testing some other data sets there. But we do also take this very seriously, and we have a few mitigations in place. I mean, the first one is that there's only a limited number of people who can access the nodes, so writing anything to the disk is particularly boring. Um, but we also run the uh, tests with networking turned on, so you can't open a socket and write out uh, the database or, or anything interesting. The only thing that leaves the system is the logs, and so you might be able to write something to the logs. However, we filter the logs. So we know what the logs um, are meant to look like, and if they don't look like that, then we filter them out. Um, which maybe that will bite us because someone will write a patch that modifies what logs look like, but they're probably just going to let us know, hey, this failed and I can't see the logs, what's going on, and we can go and update it. Um, and we're also working on data set anonymization so that if you did somehow get a copy it wouldn't have anything of interest or um, reveal anything. So it's actually a little bit interesting how we do the networking turned off, so we'll look at that. Um, we first initially investigated running all these in a container, but we ran into a lot of issues with um, setting up uh, all the PIP requirements that we need, because we need to uh, install the PIP requirements not just for every stable branch, but also for every patch, because the patch may introduce a new requirement. Um, so it became very tricky to manage. Um, modern Linux kernels have this thing called NetNS, or, or Network Namespaces, which allow us to dis, um, find virtual Ethernet adapters that run in their own network namespace with their own routing rules and their own IP tables. And you can set them up something like this, which is a little bit of jargon. Um, basically, the only port that we have open here uh, is MySQL, simply because MySQL runs outside of that process. So it looks a bit like that in that the migration process is done off to the side here, and the only way it can talk back into default processes is when it wants to talk to the MySQL database. Um, outside of the actual, where, where is this DB upgrade process? That's where we're running the Nova manage part of the script. The rest of the script, script which is um, not able to be modified, um, does the setting up of the pip directories and all those other things. Yeah, the part of the pip problem was that it was actually very difficult to install pip, uh, a virtual env in one place and then copy it into another place. And virtual env actually has this flag for being able to move um, environments around. But then if you look at the documentation, it's like this is experimental and doesn't work. And yes, it doesn't work. Um, and, oh yeah, sorry. Oh, that's a warning. Um, yeah, and so the IP uh, network namespace uh, commands just run a little bit like that. 
Right, so do it yourself. How can you do this? What can you take away? Well, I mean, the first thing um, is that we use Zool. Uh, I recommend doing it if you're doing this kind of CI stuff. So you can read through Zool and set that up for yourself. But you could probably set this up as a trigger from some other system as well. <coughs> um, so you, as long as you're triggering somehow, that's all good. So you configure that. Uh, you set up Turbo Hipster uh, and configure it with the database that you need to test against. So you put in your, say, data sets and you put, in the, put them in and you tune them to what you need. Um, and now because I've only got five minutes, I have a few slides on some interesting bugs that we've caught. And I've got a couple of slides on um, tuning our databases. So I can either go over those or I'm happy to take questions. Slides? Examples? Oh, yeah, okay. So one of the bugs we caught was um, this one. Uh, basically, th this was why we're still developing this CI system. So we weren't commenting back in, which meant that we caught it after the fact, which is a little bit sad. But someone had written this migration that would take 20 minutes to run on a database with only 45,000 rows, which isn't very many, by the way, uh, particularly for this table. Um, and so 20 minutes is an incredibly long time. It's probably going to take us a few hours to run on our data set. Uh, so, you know, like in Rackspace Public Cloud. So we uh, went back to these people and we said, look, this is a problem. And they're like, oh, well, I'll have a look at it. And the actual end result, which you can pull out of the slide deck later, was that the developers modified their migration to bring the time down. And then they looked at the results from Turbo Hipster and they went, oh, yeah, it's a bit better, but I can do better again. And they kept iterating on the design until they got it to an acceptable state. But if you remember, I warned against you modifying migrations. They were doing this in a way that's called item potent, which simply means that if you ran it in any of the states that they tried in, the end result would be the same, even if you ran it more than once. Um, the actual answer to this query, uh, to, to fixing this migration, was to express it all as SQL, because it turns out that database engines are kind of good at handling data. and. Uh, much better than reading out all the rows, modifying it, and writing it back in. So lesson to be learned there. Um, another one that was caught was uh, someone wanted to change a string that held true or false um, and change it into a boolean. That's a very good idea. Um, however, however, rewriting, so changing a column type is an entire table, uh, right? yes, table lock. Um, and requires rewriting every row, so it's very, very slow. Um, the reason why it is a string and not a boolean to begin with was due to API compatibilities. Um, once the IPA, sorry, yeah, the API is um, bumped a version, we can fix this properly and just drop the column altogether. Um, and some secondary effects that we had is that we actually got some really interesting performance information out of this. We test both Pocona and MySQL. We'd like to be testing Postgres and DB2, but we don't have any data sets to test against. Um, and, but we're able to see what performs better. And in, in general, Pocona is actually a little bit faster than MySQL. So if you're uh, using either of those, it might be a good thing to consider the performance difference. Um, and we, we graphed the results of how long the migrations take. And, and this just allows us, if you remember, we were tuning the what is acceptable times for each migration. Um, we, we were able to use this to kind of get it roughly right. It's a little bit of a guessing game, but we can kind of see some error margins and have a guess of what we think is acceptable. And there's some other things that we'd like to do. Um, we would like to use uh, something other than Garrett to, um, for Zool to talk to. Zool's actually reasonably modular, so it wouldn't be very hard to have a GitHub um, trigger in Zool. Um, not that it would be used to us, but then I think it would make it a lot more accessible to other people. Um, at the moment, it's very specific to people who are using the Garrett code review. We do want to get the data set anonymization stuff done, but it's actually quite difficult. Um, we have actually made this more scalable using node pool, so it's actually very elastic. The number of turbo hips to workers at the moment will scale depending on demand. So there's kind of five just sitting there waiting to do something, and then it will burst out to a couple of hundred um, during peak, peak traffic. Um, and yeah, I mentioned we want to test other engines and reduce false positives is an obvious one. Um, but yeah, that's everything. So uh, I might have a minute for questions or a, a question or two. Right. Thank you. <laughs>